All right, ladies and gentlemen, so a little bit over a month ago, I promised videos about both Dungeons and Dragons, and I've sat down and made these videos a couple times, but I have not been satisfied with the quality of my content because I want to do a little bit more research before I jump into these two books because I feel like they're important books. But in the meantime, I'm going to make a quick video and kind of give you an overview of the concepts of Dungeons and Dragons within the game. Dungeons and Dragons. And first we'll start with Dungeons because it comes first in Dungeons and Dragons. So let's take a look at this cover art for the book that goes on the front cover and the back cover. And it'll explain a couple things about Dungeons. So what we see here is an adventuring party fighting a group of monsters called Beholders. And you see here they're in a natural cavern now dungeons could either be natural formations like the one you see here or they could be man-made levels below the ground of a building. So you could have man-made or natural or you could have a combination of both where someone made a man-made dungeon that went into the ground and eventually it opens up into natural caverns. So you could have either one or a combination of both of them. And then typically your nastiest, scariest monsters live in the dungeons and they don't like coming out in the light and they like scheming and plotting in the depths of the earth and then every once in a while they'll come up to the top and do whatever they're going to do. Or more often they get minions and they control lesser beings to go and make their attacks to the above world for them. So once again what you see here is an adventuring party where you have a tiefling which is a human with um, some fiend blood in him so that's why you see the horns on his head and it looks like you have maybe a paladin uh, some kind of human warrior there with a fire sword and then it looks like you have a ranger a human ranger readying his bow and then it looks like you have a human sorcerer of some sort floating around looking scared at the three coming from the back so this kind of gives you a, a picture of what's going to happen in a dungeon. Um, normally there's a reason why adventurers are going to go into a dungeon like this. Either they're going to seek some kind of information or allies or most often they're just going in there for treasure because if you think about it, the more people who die in a dangerous place, the more stuff they leave behind and the more wealth accumulates to whoever's in control of that dungeon or that place. So generally, they're the most risky places to go in, but they have the biggest rewards too. So that's what you see here on the cover, and it says an essential guide to dungeon adventuring. So this book right here is both for the player and the dungeon master, which, excuse me, which means it has information that's useful to everyone who plays Dungeons and Dragons. Whether you're running the game as a dungeon master or you're playing in it as a player. This book's gonna have information for you. And then let's um, find one more piece of artwork here I could talk about before we move on. Here we go. So you see here another scene in a dungeon. It looks like a perfect example of what I was talking about, half natural, half man-made. If you look at the walls here and the crevasse, it looks natural, definitely not man-made. But then if you look at the bridge coming across it, definitely man-made. And you can see, once again, another adventuring party of four people. Now, these four characters are characters I recognize from the third edition of Dungeons & Dragons. And the only one I know their name, oh, actually, it's like Tordrick, Linda, Josanne, and no idea, but he's going to die anyway. So is it really relevant? Probably not. And you can see them crossing the bridge, which is a dangerous place, obviously, because it looks like you have these gargoyles that swoop down. And I don't know how he fell here. It looks like the gargoyles are reaching for him now. But um, I don't know. Somehow he fell off, and he it looks like he's going to take a tumble. We don't know how far he's going to fall, but um, Gargoyle's coming after him, it looks like. So 
bottom line is dungeons are dangerous places and that's kind of the focal point of Dungeons and Dragons. When they made the game they kind of catered it around dungeon adventuring. That was kind of like the highlight. Now there's definitely rules and ways to go adventuring above the ground and then that does happen a lot probably just as often as dungeon um, dungeon diving but at the same time it was really catered towards going through a dungeon all right now we got that part out of the way let's talk about dragons now dragons are a really cool topic because dragons come up in all parts of world history every culture has a reference to some kind of giant lizard creature from china to south america the dragon in Dungeons & Dragons is a really a unique dragon. I guess it goes heavily off the European version of a dragon. Um, here in the cover art, another great cover art, what you'll see is a family of red dragons. You see all their treasure. That's a, that's a common thing. The dragons love their treasure and they hoard it. No one quite knows why, but they, they love the treasure and they'll defend it with their lives. So you see one of the dragons, I'm, I'm not sure if it's female or male, honestly I'm not sure if you could tell, but quite possibly. And you have the other partner coming in here with some food, which looks like a barded war horse. So it probably wasn't easy to get that horse, so it's just kind of showing you the power of dragons right here. And actually, you can see one hatching right here. There's different age groups of dragons. You have wormlings, which is the brand new baby dragons. And you have young dragons. And this looks like an adult dragon. And at the very end of the cycle, you have the great worm, which is the oldest, most powerful dragons. Dragons in Dungeons & Dragons are intelligent and they could speak. They could speak multiple languages usually, depending on the kind of dragon. Some are more intelligent than others. But generally, the dragons speak. They speak their own languages, and they also speak the common tongue. In addition to that, the dragons can assume human form and live amongst humans. And certain kind of dragons enjoy doing that more than others. And some dragons spend most of their lives in human form. And when they do that, it can be hard to tell if you're talking to a dragon or not. So some of them don't even reveal that they are dragons. Here you see the 10 variations of true dragon. There's, five, there's two categories, each of five. You have the chromatic dragons which are the evil dragons, and you have the metallic dragons, which are the good dragons. And the chromatic ones are a little bit more well known, and I can name to you all the chromatic dragons right here, but I'll probably mess up when it comes to the metallic dragons, because they're a little bit, eh, they don't stand out quite as much, for whatever reason. Anyways, let me, uh, let me show you the couple dragons here, my laser pointer. So down here on the bottom right, you have the black dragon, and you can tell the black dragon, pretty much his horns give him away really hard, how they come out. He, the whole dragon's face kind of looks like a skull, a recessed skull, and black dragons spit acid. That's their, that's their breath weapon, acid. Next to him, you have the white dragon. White dragons are the least intelligent of all the dragons. They're the most animalistic and they're the least likely to be intelligent and they're the least likely to be able to cast magic out of all the dragons and you can tell his face he's kind of streamlined he has one horn that kind of goes back and runs back into his neck and then let me see you have the red dragon on the top right you might guess that they're oh Really quick, the breath attack of the white dragon is frost, icy cold breath. In contrast, you might guess the red dragon breathes fire. And you can see he has two horns going back like that. It's kind of a unique face as well. And then down here you have the blue dragon who has one horn coming off his forehead, one big horn. 
kind of funny looking ears. And that's how you can tell you're dealing with a blue dragon. Blue dragons like living in the desert and they often come in combat with brass dragons, which are a good dragon variation that also live in the desert. And blue dragons have a breath weapon of electricity. And then the last chromatic dragon or evil dragon is the green dragon down here on the bottom left. Green dragons breathe noxious fumes for their breath attack, poisonous gas. And they don't have any horns, but they have um, this dinosaur-like thing coming back. And the green dragons live in forests. And then let me try, I can tell you for sure, two of the good dragons, two of the metallic dragons. On the top left you have the gold dragon, the most powerful of them, and you can tell him from his catfish-like whiskers coming off his face. Right here you have the silver dragon. And then that leaves us with three more, brass, bronze, and copper. Hmm. I think, you know what, I'm not even going to guess, I don't want to tell you guys the wrong stuff, but obviously this is one of them, this is one of them, and this is one of them. And actually, let's go figure that out right now. That'll be the last thing we do for this video. Let me show you the pictures so we get this straight. Because you know, they really are, are interesting, the brass, bronze, and copper dragons. There's nothing uninteresting about them, they just, something about it makes them a little bit harder to remember. And I know one of them is really talkative. One of them just likes talking to everyone. If you pass by his, his lair, he might kidnap you and just keep you there because he just wants to talk to you. And he might talk your ear off and talk about all sorts of stuff. And the best way to get away from him is just to give him his conversation and become friends with him. And then maybe he'll leave you alone. So let's see. We're going to page 40. Page 40, we're going to see the brass dragon. So there it is. That's the one I was going to guess, and I think I was going to guess it wrong, so I'm glad I didn't guess. You can see he, he has like a, almost like a crown on his head. Interesting wing setup where his wings scale all the way down to the tip of his tail. And then he had the bronze dragon right here, which has multiple horns kind of coming off on its skull. So a more typical wing setup. And then lastly, you have the copper dragon. So there you go. I explained a little bit about the three dragons that are most commonly left out. So hopefully we gave them a little bit more attention. You can see his wings are kind of like a variation of the other two. Let's go back and look really quick. There's the brass. There's the bronze. And there's the copper. It looks like almost in between. Anyways, there's a short video that I promised to talk a little bit about Dungeons and Dragons. So stay tuned, there's gonna be a lot more videos coming up mainly focusing on the newest edition of D&D &D here for a little bit. Have a great day.